So a famous Washington figure, John F. Kennedy, once said, uh, life is unfair. We know that right now following a rap act, but, <laughs> but you, <laughs> you shouldn't feel that sorry for our guest, John Krafcik. He has arguably the coolest sounding job in America right now as head of Google's self-driving car project. I could tell you a lot about his background. That would take all the time we have. I'll simply make the point, you are a genuine car guy. You've been CEO of Hyundai America, you've worked at Ford, Toyota, General Motors, the whole lot, and now you are at the tech company, Google. Tell us about the state of self-driving cars. So, um, thanks, Jim. It's, um, it, it is a really cool job, I have to say. Um, and it's great to be here representing the work of, of hundreds of incredible Google engineers working on this. Um, you know, it got its start um, through the DARPA challenge um, uh, back about 10 years or so ago. Uh, there had been a couple of rounds of these DARPA challenges, which were designed to um, see if we could do self-driving cars with a little bit of help from, uh, from the government. And um, uh, the Google founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, had, had seen a couple of these things, and they had this idea that um, maybe if we brought um, Google's software capabilities to bear on this problem, we could help accelerate um, the progress in this mm -hmm. field. Um, so over the course of the last seven and a half years or so, we've been hard at work trying to make that happen. I think what's exciting about what you're doing for all of us in D.C., watching online, and in, in, in the world in general, is all the potential ramifications of what you're doing. It'll affect urban layouts, the way cities are designed. It'll affect commuting patterns, whether people buy cars, you know, the manufacturing, a car industry will be changed, pollution, safety, uh, all, all the other mm -hmm. things of that sort. Tell us right now, what are the challenges you've solved and what are the next ones ahead? Sort of the medium term and longer term holy grails of making self-driving cars real. So the thing that, that, that's really motivating us is, is, is one of the many things on that long list, which is, of course, safety. Um, it, it's pretty amazing to think that um, as a global society, we're, we're sort of okay with 1.25 million fatalities every year on the, on the world's uh, roadways. Um, in the US, we lose about 35,000 souls to um, uh, freeway accidents on an annual basis. And we went the wrong way, Jim, this, this past year. We were up about 7% in, in terms of number of fatalities. So um, in terms of what's pacing us, right, it is that. It is that desire to improve safety. Um, we're driven as well by the desire to um, give mobility to folks who don't have mobility right now. Um, there are probably 20 or 30 million um, Americans who are of driving license age. Um, who don't have their licenses. So those, those are the, some of the reasons that, that we're moving forward with this um, as quickly as we can. In terms of pacing problems, I, I gotta tell you, the, the technology is just fundamentally very challenging, as you would imagine it would be. Um, and there are varying levels of complexity. So um, solving the problem on highways, um, for example, um, is a reasonably complicated problem. Um, trying to solve the problem in cities and suburbs where you have cars moving at different speeds, mm -hmm. Um, and you have the added complexity of cyclists and pedestrians and crosswalks and traffic going in multiple directions all at once um, and four-way stop signs. I mean, that level of complexity is probably a, a couple of orders of magnitude higher. So um, challenge number one is just um, solving that technical problem. And I want to go back to one specific point you mentioned. You said there was a recent um, bad in, a change in the trends of auto safety. My experience is, you know, when I was a kid, there were no seat belts, there was yeah. no, no airbags, anything like that. We had a long time of sort of a shame campaign against drunk driving. I assume the recent deterioration is because of distracted driving with texting. Is that your assumption too? I think we have a lot of data points that say, yeah, yeah. this distracted driving is definitely uh, causing a problem. We still have a huge problem with people driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. That's about 30 to 40 percent, depending on which data set you look at. Um, but yeah, this new, um, the, the distraction thing that we have been um, sort of suffering through as a society over the last 10 years with the introduction of the smartphone, it's a real problem. Um, and, and here's the thing. Um, Humans, when they want to be, can be really good drivers. Um, but there are so many things that, that get in the way of our lives and tend to distract us um, that it keeps us from, from keeping that high standard. It's one of the problems we aim to solve with, uh, with our approach to self-driving. And I'm going to set up this next question just by, by an analogy of the difficulty of, of, of driving. So as, as you know, I'm a longtime avid pilot. And people think of uh, flying airplanes as being dangerous. The sen sensation that every pilot has is you land the airplane. That's the one most sort of uh, technically challenging part of the flight is, is landing the airplane. Then you get in the car and you realize the danger is actually beginning now because you're surrounded by people <laughs> at very high speeds, you know, driving at very close uh, distances with each other. Tell us how 
with that very complex uh, thing of managing, you know, hundreds of cars with very close distances, what are the decisions that your machines and systems can now make? What decisions can they not make? When are we going to have a transition of actually it'll be um, what are now important human decisions being uh, transferred off to your systems? It starts really with, with, with great maps. So um, one of the elemental um, things that we've work, been working on at, at Google is, is mapping these areas that we're driving with really highly detailed 3D maps. Um, and then the, the massive amount of sensing that we have on our vehicles, which includes really great cameras and radar systems and LIDAR systems or laser systems to see the world. Um, we compare the world that we're perceiving when we're in our car to the maps that we've generated and imagine what the things that are new to the map, um, what they might do, and we predict those movements um, for literally everything that is moving or might be moving in the world around us. So you can imagine a lot of computer processing power is required for that, it's true. Um, and then we connect that with where the user in the vehicle wants to go, um, and then that massive compute power is used to sort of solve that multivariate equation of okay, this is the most appropriate path through that world and the speed that I should take given everything that I know about the world and the surroundings. And, and so given the complexity of, of these challenges you're trying to master and the test beds you have, what, in four cities now of having right. these cars in operation, for people in this room, when really will our lives be any different because of the technology you're developing? Honestly, I think a lot of it's going to depend on, on, on where you all live um, because there are some areas where it's going to make sense for us to deploy this technology sooner. Um, it, it turns out there are varying levels of technical complexity. So um, um, self-driving car technology does best in good weather. It's more challenged by blizzards, as real human <laughs> drivers are as well, right? Um, we would probably um, prefer an orthogonal street layout like you might find in a city like Phoenix to um, the street layout in a place like Boston, right? Um, so um, when you think about self-driving, um, I like the analogy of comparing it to when you were getting your teenagers ready to drive, something that, that I've, I've recently committed, uh, completed for my two. Um, you put your new teens into places where the technical complexity isn't too bad. So my son had his first experience in a high school parking lot, right? Um, and then later, um, he could move to other areas of increasing complexity. Um, you're going to see the rollout of self-driving um, complexity uh, or self-driving technology in that same way with varying levels of complexity as we go. And good. so let me ask you now about some of the ramifications, not directly the technology you're developing, but what it'll mean for the rest of the world. I'm interested in businesses. I'm interested in, in employment and things. So first on the business front, why is Google in this field, you know, originally a search engine company, why is it doing this? What kind of partnerships does Google imagine making with, with auto manufacturers, with companies like Uber? What does this mean for you all as a business? I think the, the, the genesis of the idea came from the fact that this was a really big and interesting problem to solve, right? Um, that the world shouldn't be accepting this terrible tax on humanity with all the fatalities we mm -hmm. see through, uh, through driving. Um, so I think it came from, from that first founding principle. Wow, this is a really big problem. Um, and sort of the Venn diagram intersection of that was, is there a way that our technology and the things that we're good at and we tend to be good at software, but we also have some hardware capabilities that, that we're showing the world with this technology. Um, that intersection means this is, a, is an interesting space for us to move into. So that's really the reason um, why we're here. Um, in terms of the business applications of it and where it might go, I mean, we can imagine a lot of different things, Jim. Um, um, for example, we are working with, uh, with OEMs right now. We have a partnership with FCA uh, to build more cars with us. Um, we'll have the world's first driving uh, Chrysler Pacifica minivans on the road in no time. And then those end up being really interesting vehicles um, for self-driving. Um, they have power sliding doors. Um, they have lots of seating configurations. So we can get lots of different users of all shapes and sizes into this vehicle and see how they interact with the te technology. That's um, sort of a, a Google core uh, product development idea is you want to get your work in front of users as quickly as possible see how they experience it, and, and see how we can make it better from that point. And there have been two competing business narratives and press accounts of, of your work. One says that this will be something that established car companies, like the ones you've worked for before, this will be a new competence for them that GM, Ford, et cetera, will, will uh, th there are things they know how to do, will we'll, uh, have them win out. The other is this will be something for new companies, whether it's the Teslas or companies we don't know about. 
How do you imagine the car industry and also manufacturing capacity being affected by your work? So I think from the technology rollout standpoint, you're, you're going to see traditional automakers embracing the technology. I think they see it as something they have to learn. It's, it, it's going to be a core competency for these guys with time. Um, that said, we're, we're speaking with all of them and understanding if there's a way that we can bring our work to bear um, and, and perhaps move their efforts forward with a partnership, right? So we're having those discussions. Um, for the new companies in the space, um, you know, we're, we think that's a really interesting and helpful development. Um, a lot of different people trying to solve the, the same problem is going to help us get to the final solution more quickly. In the end, competition is a good thing, and I think that's what we're seeing in the space right now. And There's do, so much interest. And do companies like Ford and GM, do they view you as friend or enemy or just reality? Um, you know, the, the term that we use in the Valley a lot is frenemy, and, and maybe that's an appropriate that, term. That term is known here, here too. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah. so, so another uh, economic implication, as you well know from your manufacturing background, wave after wave of industry around the world has been affected by technological displacement. There's jobs that used to employ hundreds of thousands of people that just are done by robots now. There, there's been a line of speculation that, for example, the truck driving industry, the taxi driving industry, the substantial number of people around the world who make their living operating vehicles, that this is going to be the next big wave of extinction, if you will. How, how do you think about that? Um, I think we, as, as a society, need to start thinking about that for sure. Um, I think one of the ways to help frame the discussion is to realize that we really don't know today how this is going to impact the world two, three, four decades from now, right? It's going to be some incremental change that comes with time. Um, for sure, there are lots of new industries and capability requirements that are going to come because of this. We can't even imagine them now, Jim, right? Um, we really, truly have, have no idea. Um, but if you, if you take this idea out, the idea that um, with the personal car ownership model, our vehicles sit, roughly speaking, about 95% of the time mm -hmm. idle, right? Um, they're only used about 5% of the time. Um, that's a massive capital inefficiency, and we can do much better as a society if we figure out another way to do that. So if you take that to its, its sort of its conclusion, and we truly are 30, 40, 50 years from now able to call for transportation whenever we need it, and something shows up and takes you to your next destination, um, there's a massive savings, um, both from a capital standpoint, um, but also from a, a human productivity standpoint, because all of that time that we all were spending driving cars has now been replaced with something that allows us to be very productive. And that has to be a massive industry that has massive um, ancillary parts that we can't even begin to imagine at this point. But there will be maintenance opportunities. There will be um, the very beneficial aspects of the high value add associated with the mechanical parts of this system because truly self-driving cars have pretty sophisticated sensing systems, processing systems, and all of the pieces that pull those things together. So lots of benefits, but yeah, we need to think and start thinking about some of the immediate displacement impacts of this as well. So we're meeting here in Washington, home, as you may be aware of regulation and legislation and things of that sort. You're developing a technology that's going to call for profound regulatory changes of all sorts, mainly because there's such emphasis on safety in transportation. Tell us, and you know too that the, the Atlantic has run, run stories recently yeah. about the Google's um, connections with regulators of, of how you're, you're doing your work. Tell us the kinds of regulate, ways in which the government at either federal or state level is guiding the development of this technology in a good way, things you think the government needs to pay more attention to, the overall regulatory framework. Yeah, um, I do think it's so critical for there to be massive information um, sharing at this point between the players in the space and the folks thinking about the best way to set guidelines and guardrails to, to ensure the technology is deployed as quickly and as safely as possible. So um, I think we've had the opportunity to have that sort of dialogue, and that's, I think, good news both from Google's standpoint, but also from NHTSA and the DOT and others who we've been speaking with to make sure that we get this thing started on the, on the right foot. Um, so I think that's been a very, very positive thing. Um, you know, we have the, the new regulatory guidelines that have come out, the guidelines that, that NHTSA and the DOT have uh, have issued in the last week or so, and um, I think that's a wonderful start for, uh, for this dialogue to continue. It sets up a framework for us to, to work yeah. together, and it gives us a path to getting this out to users in the real world. 
So in the world of aviation regulation, there's a very, very powerful bias towards not changing things that are working now. The sort of uh, ain't broke, don't fix it model, which means that it can take, you know, years to change the announcements you hear on airlines or whatever. Is, the, is there a comparable bias? Is it a proper bias? Uh, well, how do you view that, that bias against innovation in the regulation you encounter? Um, you know, it, it's probably too early to, yeah. to give a vote um, on, on that or not, other than I can say that I think the innovation here is going to happen at a very, very yeah. rapid pace, and I think the focus should be on um, the performance of the systems as opposed to the, the code within the systems, mm -hmm. right? Um, it makes sense for us to come to some agreement on how do we know that we have a, self, uh, a safe self-driving car and move forward from that standpoint. I think it was at Google long ago that I first heard the term failing fast, trying things, learning from they succeed or fail. It's really different to do that with a car than with a search engine that is giving you a, a 404 page or something. That's right. In the trials you've had in these four cities, what kind of failing fast have you done? What have you seen that worked in ways that surprised you? What didn't work in the way, ways that surprised you? What do you know that you didn't know before the trials? Um, well, one of the key things that's important for everyone to understand about how we're testing this technology is we have, when we're on public roads, we always have a test driver um, in the driver's seat. So they're always there monitoring even when we're in autonomous vehicle mode. Um, and Jim and mentioned this, but we now have um, two million miles of that mm. autonomous um, mode practice in, on public roads. So we have literally seen just about everything that the world has to throw at us. And uh, we do feel pretty strongly that that public world testing is one of the things that has informed our progress and, and helped accelerate our progress going forward. Um, in terms of things we've learned, I mean, we've learned that you cannot predict what the world is going to throw at you. And uh, one of my favorite stories is, is the story of, of one day we were testing in, um, in Mountain View. And we came across a strange scene, which our software algorithm programmers could not have anticipated. Um, it was a scene with um, an older woman in an electric wheelchair, driving around on the road, holding a broom in her hand, <laughs> chasing a duck. <laughs> no kidding. And we you were didn't very. Foresee that? Come on. We, we did not foresee <laughs> that. We did not program for that. And we were very happy to see that the car, upon coming upon this thing, just stood there and watched, much like we would. <laughs> and then once the, uh, the wheelchair lady drove away, the car proceeded. Now, one thing I'm very proud of, um, I think most of us would have taken out our cell phones and taken a picture of this <laughs> and put it on our Instagram account. Our car did not do that. And, and there's some pride that comes with that. And I assume, are there comparable scenarios of like a little toddler running out into the road? How do you deal with things like that? Oh, um, you know, Having, having the safety drivers yeah. in the car would, would protect us for any situations like that. Um, but how we anticipate things like that, which are somewhat predictable, is something we call structured testing. Um, so we have a proving ground um, in, um, uh, in, in California, in the midsection of California, not far from Fresno, um, where our team of, of structured testers think of diabolical things to try and confuse the car. Um, anything that you can imagine, other than the duck, I suppose, uh, we've tried to uh, throw at the car. Um, and we do have a very, very serious point of view on children and pedestrians in, in general, the most fragile users of roadways and sidewalks around vehicles. So we're, we're very, very cautious around them. So we just have literally one minute here. One reason I love reporting on technology is you see people who are just doing things you didn't imagine, even including the, the wheelchair and, and the duck, Tell us one other surprising thing from your work that you think, you know, you know from jailing these cars that all of us would be surprised by. Oh, well, I, I don't know if this, is, if this is necessarily so surprising, but um, all of us, we're sort of scary on the road. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. In the two million miles of autonomous driving that we've done, um, we have been um, hit, rear-ended multiple times by <laughs> distracted humans. <laughs> And um, it's, it's just surprising um, that we all can't even respect the few self-driving cars that are on the road right now. Um, so I'm hoping that we can all pull together and do a better job, but seriously, pay attention when you're on the road. Put down your phone, keep your hands on the wheel, and uh, we'll all be much better off. So I, I think I speak for all in this crowd, all in America, all in the world, and saying Godspeed in your efforts, and we'll look, for, look forward to seeing more. Look forward to that. Thanks, everybody.